Hello everybody and welcome to another hobby cheating video and today it's time to go green. Let's paint a goblin. Uh, the strict technomancer that is Vinci V. Let us get to the technique and learn it Vinci V. So Uncle Adam and I's newest game uh, is out. It's called the Great Goblin Argle Bargle. It's part of Snarl, our annual zine we release that not only contains a new game, but also update for all our existing games. If you're interested in checking out the great Goblin Argle Bargle to have some goblin fun, or any of our other games, you can find the links for all of that down in the description. But since this game is all about playing a bunch of goblins and having fun uh, with them all around the, the, the great goblin, well, today I thought we'd paint up a goblin. So let's head over to the desk and let's paint a very fun goblin. I wanted a suitably, I, almost goofy goblin for my great goblin in the great goblin Argle Bargle. As you can tell from the name, the game is meant to be a little silly, a little fun, more of a party game. Uh, and so I picked this old goblin shaman that I had. He's a really fun little boy. We're going to start with the skin. And I'm going to use the colors you see here. Basically a progression from dark green to light green. But importantly, I'm also going to be including some pink color. Pinks are really important for goblins, as not only does it make the green brighter, but it makes the goblin feel alive. So let's begin by painting the skin. I start with this very dark black green, and I'm just painting a very thin coat of it over all the skin. This is really just setting my deepest shadows and recesses and things like that. Now from this point, I go into uh, some green skin and then eventually into the bright yellow green. And what I'm doing is just taking half steps up each time. So the first layer is 50-50 between this black green and the green skin. And then I go 50-50 between, or sorry, then green skin itself, then halfway between the green skin and the yellow green, and then eventually the pure yellow green and so on. I progress my way up around the model, focusing in on the, especially the face. This guy's face is like, 33% of his entire body size. So he has, just has a huge head. His head is huge. Um, so at any rate, I really want to focus in on things like the nose, the very expressed cheeks and eyelids and the chin, you know, all those sorts of things. While also making sure that stuff like the knuckles, this is sort of an old scale mini. So he has these giant hands, uh, and but making sure that those are well expressed. Stuff like the legs and things like that, they're down there. I hit them a little bit, but I'm not really paying as much attention to them. I work that light all the way up, making sure that I've got that nice bright yellow green, uh, a very nice high highlight on important places like the bridge of the nose, the top of the eyelids, the top of the cheeks, and so on. Uh, you'll notice on stuff like the chin, I'm really trying to focus those highlights in at the very top of the chin where it meets those sort of oversized lips that he has, or lip, I guess, in this case, he only has one. Uh, once that's all in place, we've got our green progression. Now, I think a lot of people stop here, but the reality is we need to integrate some pinks. So I'm going to use both the pink you saw earlier as well as the Raging Rouge from Army Painter, but both of these are perfectly fine. Um, they're just, those two tones are really nice for this sort of like uh, pink that shows in orc skin. And you'll see as I'm applying this, I focus on things like the nose, the elbows, the knuckles, uh, the cheeks, effectively anywhere where on a human, there would be red expressed. Um, so, we use these pink tones for a couple reasons. One, it's effectively acting as a red. That's its true color. And so it's acting as a complementary color to the green. It will make the green seem brighter. Two, it makes the creature more credible and alive because then there are tonal variations that are occurring in the same places we expect them to on humans. Elbows, knees, knuckles, places where the skin is thin, but also places where there would be blood. So the cheeks, the end of the nose, and so on, where there tends to be a lot of capillaries that often get expressed through that red tone in human skin. So when it, here, what we're using it for instead is to just bring life to the overall uh, goblin. And you can see how as we progress along and I get these colors in here, we end up with, uh, frankly, a much more uh, vibrant green-yellow skin as well as just a cool looking model. Now, 
I made his nose really, really pink because he has this big, ridiculous nose, like this silly goblin nose. Um, but of course, and also the inside of the ears, by the way, that's another important place. Um, but I, uh, you know, you don't have to push it this far. If you're trying to be a little more restrained, you can be a little more subtle. One of the keys is that when you work this in, you often want to then take some of that pink, mix it with some of the uh, either mid-tone or highlight green, and then glaze the transition between the pink and the green. Um, those two colors, when they mix, will form a more neutral, dirtyish yellow-green-brown tone, and it actually acts as the perfect glaze to smooth your transitions between the green and the pink, so you're not just jumping suddenly from, the, uh, from something that's very expressed as green into something that's very expressed as pink. So, with a few glazes in place to smooth those transitions, the skin is done. Now, the next most common, uh, or sort of dominant, I suppose, there we go, element on this dude is his robes. And we're going to focus in on really the skin, the robes, and bone. Because I feel like there's three interesting things we can talk about here. So, the first one was that orcish skin. Now, I want to talk about painting yellow. So, I wanted his robes to be yellow. I just think yellow is a fun color. I think it looks good on goblins, especially good next to the yellow-green skin. Um, so, what I do here is I grab a couple of desaturated yellow ochres. Now, these are actually from uh, uh, Flamion's line with Army Painter, and I really like them for painting yellow for a few reasons. First, I, they're a nice desaturated yellow color. They're not like kick-you-in-the-face yellow, but don't worry, we'll get there. And they also, then what we're going to do is bring in some of the Army Painter Speed Paint Yellow to, in, to get that instantiated saturation later. But... Don't worry about that at the moment. I pick these two yellow ochres because they also have a really high opacity. Now, I'm working over a zenithal. People often say yellow is hard to paint. That's not true. It's very easy to paint. You just need the right colors underneath. This is another way to make yellow easier. In this case, not only do I have a zenithal, which makes yellow easier, but I'm also using these ochres, which have a much higher opacity and much better coverage quality. Um, so what I do here is just some quick wet blends. You'll notice I'm working between the two tones. I build up a halfway tone. So again, this is just, there's a 50-50 in here. And I just work the robe. Quick wet blending, working fast over the entire robe to get it in place. No problem, no drama llama. So you'll see how effectively and efficiently this covers. It just really does instantly uh, cover all the spaces I need. I don't really have to worry about uh, working very thin, building it up over like 20 layers as you would with yellow over something dark. The combination of the zenithal and the ochre means this becomes a dream. Once that's there, I kind of clean it up a little off camera because it's very hard for me to paint this very tiny guy on camera and not get my head in the frame. Uh, so uh, once that's done, I come back and now I take a little bit of the Army Painter Speed Paint, um, that yellow you saw originally, and I just do some very thin glazes of it over all of the yellow, running it completely over everything. The advantage here is that brings in that intense mid-yellow saturation. So I get that really nice yellow saturation without having to work for it at all. We started with the ochres, but we ended with a wonderful intense yellow. And it was frankly very little effort. This is one of those great tricks for painting yellow, is you use slightly off steps that have better coverage and opacity, but then simply glaze that very transparent yellow over the top to bring in that saturation. It's not this video, but as a side note, this is also, this particular yellow speed paint is also excellent for doing non-metallic gold when you need to reinstantiate your saturation at the end of that process. So, hey, just something for your toolbox. Speed paints, as always, have a lot of uses beyond just actually kind of speed painting the miniature. So, with the yellow done and those robes, you see an easier way to paint yellow. We now have the two primary factors or, or uh, features on the, the model done. Off camera, I went and painted all the little bajangles and things. This guy has a ton of little bags and mushrooms and just little tiny bajangles everywhere. My goodness, did they overpack this guy with silly details back in the day. Um, but that's okay. I paint all of those up, and that brings us to the bone. And here again, I want to talk about a different way to paint bone. 
I think the most common way people paint bone is they grab something that says like bone or looks like bone on the bottle. So a buff or a bone or a something in that way, like in that general space. And then they simply apply it and then wash it and maybe highlight it. And I just don't really like that. I just don't think it actually produces good looking credible bone. Instead, we're going to do a little bit of a hybrid that I'm going to show you here that I think is actually my favorite way to paint bone, especially on gaming miniatures. So I actually start with a mix of black brown, so of, uh, from Pro Acryl, a really dark color, okay, and some uh, buff. So there, this is like an ivory color, basically. But it's like 75-25. So it's, we're mostly dealing with the black brown here. I've just lightened it up a little. I cover the whole surface. You can see what that looks like. I then take a little bit of Agrax and mix it 50-50 with water uh, and then do a very light wash over all the bone surface. So I am still using a wash. Um, one of the few times I'll use a wash, but this bone has really, really deep recesses and I do want that to be here. Why am I doing it at this stage? Because I'm going to, I'm intending to do a lot of layering afterward. The problem with washing over the mid-tone is then you've got to do a lot of work to restore your mid-tone back. You have to repaint everything. Here, I'm using it to set my darkest shadows and be part of my scheme. So yes, I'll continue painting, but I was going to do that anyways. I'm not double dipping on any work. From there, actually what I do is just continue to mix in the ivory color, going to a 50-50, uh, a 25-75, so I'd say 25 of the percent of the very dark color and 75% of the light color, and so on, up to eventually pure bone. So you can see from this point, it's just a quick layering exercise. I work thin, and I just layer up, focusing on the top of the uh, sort of planes of the face, as well as then drawing some bright lines on the horns uh, to create those striations out to the end of the horns. In this case, I wanted the dark part of the horns to be at the base to cause more contrast with the face of the skull, whatever it is. It kind of looks like a weird antelope or cow or something. I don't know what he has on there. Anyways, and then the light part of the horns to be at the ends. You can do it either way. So I uh, basically work my way up until eventually I get to pure uh, ivory color. In this way, by starting with sort of a bright ivory and then mixing it in with a very dark bone, I can have everything I need in between with just doing some quarter, half, or third steps while still getting then a really nice, credible transition all the way up the, uh, the miniature. With those, basically, the miniature's done. I slapped some metals on after this was done. Metals are always the last part of my paint job. Uh, and here he is. Here's how my little goblin for the great goblin Argle Bargle came out. Uh, I think he looks pretty fun overall. Uh, this guy is, he'll be a great, great goblin. Uh, like I said, if you're interested in checking out uh, Snarl, our most recent zine that contains the great goblin Argle Bargle, as well as updates for many of our old games, you can check all of that out in the description below, where you can also find links to all of our existing games. Uh, if you're looking for something fun and different that you can play uh, with your kids or uh, with your partner, this can be a great way to do. It's a very fun party game. And honestly, uh, I know Tom, my co-host on Warhammer Weekly, who does a lot of development, his kids have been asking him to play the Great Goblin Argle Bargle like every week. So if you're looking for a fun game to get your kids into miniatures, hey, this could be the one. If you want to support the channel, lots of ways you can do so. You can check out all those games below. You can hit like and subscribe. That helps other people find the video. There's hobby uh, affiliate links down there. They don't cost you anything extra. In fact, they often save you money and it gives a kickback to the channel. It's a great way to support and we really appreciate it. There's also, of course, our Patreon focused on review and feedback and taking your next step on your hobby journey. We'd love to have you as part of the community. As always, though, I hope you enjoyed this, and I thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.